Don't forget to like this video, subscribe to this channel for more videos like this one, and hit that little bell so you'll be notified when we go live every week and upload new content like this one. Describe your uh, educational background and biblical studies that you have. Yeah, so my undergrad had nothing to do with biblical studies, but I went on to get my master's in biblical studies, and I'm currently a doctoral student in Old Testament studies at Amherst University. So Matt, I've heard it, uh, heard it said, uh, you celebrate Hanukkah. I absolutely love it. I love Hanukkah. A lot of people enjoy Hanukkah, um, and uh, we know it to be a festival of dedication, uh, a festival of lights, uh, lots of different... Uh, different um, celebrations that ultimately point to Yeshua, uh, us as Messianic believers. Um, we also hear a lot of objections sometimes sure. with Hanukkah, and I was wondering if we could uh, address a few of those today. Absolutely. So one of the biggest objections uh, to celebrating Hanukkah is that it's, it's not found where God presents uh, His holy feast days throughout the year and given to Israel. Should we celebrate Hanukkah? because it's not listed in Leviticus 23. I think the idea that it's not listed in Leviticus 23 being the reason for not celebrating anything really falls short. It's kind of weak because Leviticus 23 is giving us the festivals of what God deemed as His cycle of what He required of Israel, not what Israel was limited to. So these festivals, some limit them to seven, you know, it's really eight festivals. That's what God deemed as what Israel is required to do and the religious calendar and the uh, calendar of harvest. It's not something that was limited only to that. Another popular holiday that I love is Purim, which is also not listed in Leviticus 23. It is like Hanukkah, something that came after the Torah was given, but also represents another great victory of God in Israel's history. Um, it's not something that's required in Leviticus 23, yet it is in our Bibles, and it is something that Israel kept and celebrated, celebrated due to the victory of God. So that gives us an example of something that's in Scripture that's very close and similar to Hanukkah that is celebrated by Israel. It's not required, but God felt worthy of putting it in our Scriptures, uh, Old Testament Scriptures, what we refer to as the Hebrew Bible. God felt worthy of putting that Purim into our Hebrew Bible so that we would know it, recognize it, and choose whether or not we wanted to observe it. Moving forward from that, going into the Greek New Testament, the New Testament scriptures of the gospel, the, the message of Yeshua, our Messiah, that had been uh, prophesied forward from the Hebrew scriptures, we do have the Feast of Dedication listed, the Festival of Lights, as it said in John 10. So the Bible does testify both Purim and Hanukkah celebrations in Israel's history that wasn't necessarily listed in Leviticus 23, but nothing would say that we couldn't partake of God's victory over the dark, evil empires that would come against Israel. So you mentioned John chapter 10. Um, heard the objection many mm -hmm. times that uh, uh, you know Jesus didn't celebrate. It, the scripture never tells us Jesus celebrated Hanukkah uh, in John chapter 10. It simply states that it was winter, it was the, during the time of the Feast of Dedication, and Jesus was in Jerusalem in the temple. Absolutely. I've heard this argument before in, in previous discussions with other believers, and again, I think this argument is something that uh, really kind of falls flat uh, in the face of Scripture. One, uh, Yeshua, Jesus, our Messiah, He took the time to come to Jerusalem in winter. So He made this great journey from where He lived to Jerusalem in winter, and I don't know if you've ever been to Israel in the winter time. It's not the coldest. It's not uh, Denver, Colorado, but it's quite chilly. Some suggest that He was there just because He had a captive audience and He was able to make His statement because of who was there and He was just taking advantage of the situation. But He had seven or eight other feast days that were Leviticus 23 feast days the rest of the year that He could capitalize on that audience, and He did so. Uh, John chapter 2, he was at Passover, and several other times leading up to John chapter 7, he's Feast of Tabernacles. John chapter 8, Shemini Atzir at the eighth day. We have him appearing in Jerusalem. One great example is to, to compare John 10 to is John chapter 2. So in John chapter 2, Yeshua, Jesus, he goes up to the temple and he becomes angry. He has this righteous indignation against the people that are operating in the temple. They're cheating his brothers and sisters. They're cheating Israel out of money in the exchange rate for offerings to the temple. And what does he do? He whips the table. He over, overturns the tables, makes a court of whips, and starts whipping people. 
But the text never tells you that he was there to celebrate Passover. It simply tells you that Jesus, Yeshua, our Messiah, was in Jerusalem at Passover, and he does these things. So if we're to say that John chapter 10, his appearance at the temple for the feast of uh, or the festival of dedication does not necessarily warrant that he was celebrating Hanukkah, we would also have to conclude that John chapter 2 is no evidence that he was celebrating Passover either. I would also suggest that appearing for a celebration 99 times out of 100 means that you're celebrating it of some sort. Recently, we had a birthday party for my daughter, and, and everybody came over, family, friends. No one was there to say, I'm simply here to captivate this audience and say a few words. They were there for one purpose, celebrating a common goal or a common celebration. So I think that argument that he was not there to observe Hanukkah, the Feast of Dedication, really lacks whenever we look at the whole context of John. This is where this is placed in the story of John. It wasn't placed in Matthew, Mark, or Luke, and I think that's significant when we take into account that John mentions all these other times in chronological order that the Messiah appeared in Jerusalem at the temple. Another interesting aspect of John chapter 10 and Yeshua's appearance at the temple for the Feast of Dedication is the fact that this is the place and the time that He truly decides to reveal who He is. Up until this point, many have asked, Who are you? Tell us who you are. Tell us plainly. Uh, the few chapters leading up to this, John chapter 8, chapter 9, he says cryptic language like, I am the light of the world, which angers them, but he doesn't come out and explicitly state who he is. Here at the Feast of Dedication, at the temple in Jerusalem, during the time of Hanukkah, Yeshua says, I will give them eternal life. And it is this phrase that angers them to the point that they can now accuse him of blasphemy, according to the scriptures, because who is he saying he is? He is now saying, and they are understanding, that's important, they are understanding at this point that he has said, I am the one who has come from above. I am God in the flesh. I am the anthropomorphic version of the Spirit of God that they have talked about for hundreds and hundreds of years. So Matt, another objection I hear is that the Hanukkah, uh, or the menorah used for Hanukkah, um, is... Uh, is a manipulation of the biblical menorah and we're taking it's, it's taking a holy item uh, and we have now manipulated it uh, into something that is common and no longer holy and thus sinning yeah that's an incredible argument because the word menorah simply means candelabra or it comes from the word or which means light and it simply is a multiple lights it's a candelabra a conglomeration of candlesticks or in this sense oil across multiple bulbs. That's what a menorah is. So you could have a four-branch menorah, you could have a five-branch menorah. The temple menorah, what God instructed to be in His house, that's a seven-branch menorah. So when we simply make a Hanukkah, it's just a nine-branch menorah, fashioned in similar fashion, most, you know, according to tradition. Now I've seen Tyrannosaurus Rex menorahs and stuff like that. Those clearly aren't in the fashion of the temple menorah, but most of them traditionally are in the fashion of the temple menorah for a reason, because the Hanukkah is recognizing something that God did in His house with His people. And so that represents the, the image that it should be calling to mind, this remembrance of God's victory over His enemies and the restoration and rededication of His altar and His temple. So, of course, it would be fashioned in likeness of the temple menorah, which is the seven branch, what God said He wants in His house. But nothing requires that we could not make a candelabra of other numbers and other, uh, other fashions. As a matter of fact, in the first century, the second temple period time, and we're on the topic of John here, so this is relevant, John chapter 8, Yeshua is sitting in the court of the women, and this is the, one of the main points where He says, I am the light of the world, and He's doing so at a time where they're sitting there looking at four ginormous four-branch menorahs that are 50 foot tall sitting in the court of the women. They were lit with the wicks made from the old temple garments of the priests, and the light was so bright that it was stated that not a single courtyard was not lit by its light. So. He says, I am the light of the world, while looking at four four-branch menorahs that stand 50 foot tall. So we can have other branch menorahs 
Uh, I would not suggest that we duplicate the temple menorah and try to act as if we are replicating what God wanted in His house. Another objection that uh, uh, against Hanukkah that uh, it contains a blessing, a traditional Jewish blessing, that whenever we light one of the bulbs of the Hanukkah menorah, uh, we are to recite this blessing that acknowledges that God commanded us to light the menorah uh, of Hanukkah, which came much, much later uh, after the Torah, and, and we don't actually find that in Scripture. Yeah, traditions are beautiful. I love the study of ancient traditions and traditions of different cultures, especially traditions of cultures within the biblical context. We look at the scriptures and we see that Paul says to his audience in a couple of his letters, do not forsake the traditions that we have handed down to you. So we see that all kinds of communities throughout history had different traditions on how they did things. This is just marking one segment of people's tradition on how to keep Hanukkah. Nothing about uh, Hanukkah requires that we recite the blessing the way that someone else does and word it as such. Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who has sanctified us by His commandments and has commanded us to be a light unto the world. This is more appropriate for believers in Yeshua, Messianic believers, when they celebrate Hanukkah since Yeshua says, I am the light of the world and also gives us the instruction to be the light on the hill that will not be covered. I hear a lot of chatter about Hanukkah simply being another Sukkot, or the, uh, the Hasmoneans took Sukkot because they missed it that year, and they moved it to the winter, and that's not the date that God said Sukkot should be, so we should not, we should not celebrate it then. We should just stick for the biblical Sukkot festival in the fall. Yeah, I think the argument goes that if that was simply another Sukkot, if that was them doing Sukkot when they couldn't have done it, earlier due to the fighting. They were simply just doing what they couldn't have already done, uh, what they couldn't do earlier in the, in the year. So really the observance of Sukkot is the real Hanukkah. I think that's the argument that most people are trying to make. The issue with this is that there were other festivals that were not kept due to the fighting or due to the altar not being uh, clean or not being capable of being used. I think we lose sight of the timeline that this was two years of difference between the time that the altar was desecrated to the time that it was rededicated and thus made holy again and worthy of sacrifices. So there's two years of festivals and feasts that are not being celebrated or not being kept. Secondly, and more importantly, I think that Sukkot is mentioned in Maccabees because of its uh, relative association to the first dedication of the altar in the first temple. Second Chronicles tells us that Solomon dedicated the altar at the time of Sukkot. They celebrated Sukkot for seven days, and it was during that day, those days of Sukkot and the day after that Solomon dedicated or set apart the altar for God's first temple. So the mention of Sukkot and Maccabees is not necessarily meaning that that was the only festival that they missed. We know that they missed all of them for two years. But it should be calling the reader's mind back to the fact that they are thinking about the altar. Mac Maccabees is all about the victory that God had over the Greeks who would come against Israel and ruin his house. This calling to mind Sukkot is giving you the focus of Maccabees, which is to rededicate the altar of God. There's so much that's dependent upon this. Without rededicating the altar of God at that time, they would have to wait a couple more years before they could officially start the services back in fullness. They were left with the decision, do we wait until the next Sukkot, which would follow the pattern of Solomon and the first temple? That would be 10 months later. Do we wait till then to dedicate the altar in the same way that Solomon did? Or do we do so here and now, but in the same fashion? That is the focus, in my opinion, of why Sukkot is mentioned in Maccabees and why they bring it up in the context of the dedication of the altar. So remember guys, stay fit, stay founded in truth. Don't forget to like this video, subscribe to this YouTube channel so you can be notified when new content just like this is uploaded or when we go live every single week at our local fellowship. Blessings and Shalom.